Welcome to Chapel Wood's YouTube channel. I'm Bobby Woolley, Director of Hospitality and Outreach here at Chapel Wood. We're so glad that you found us and we hope that you enjoy the great stuff that we have for you here. Take a look around and try out the different things on the channel. You'll find weekly Sunday scripture and sermons on demand, as well as our weekly podcast called Pod Have Mercy with pastors John Stevens and Matt Russell talking openly about being the church in the real world and great videos sharing a little bit about what the Chapel Wood family is up to in Houston and around the world. Subscribe to find out when services and episodes are added and let us know how we're doing. And also let us know how you're doing and how we can pray for you by visiting chapelwood.org slash prayer and share prayer requests. We're so glad you're watching and hope what you see and hear here really makes a difference in your life. Know God loves you and we hope to get to know you soon. Thanks and enjoy the video. Our scripture for this morning comes from the gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 11 verses 1 through 6 and here's what it says. Now when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and proclaim his message in their cities. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, it is so good to be with you here today. My name is Joseph Clam. I'm uh, one of the pastors here at Chapelwood. And over the last several weeks, we have been going on a journey together, a journey in the desert. And today, we will explore the desert of doubt. We began in the desert of loneliness, and then we processed through the desert of boredom. And today, we find ourselves in the desert of doubt. Now, doubt, by definition, uh, is a feeling of not being certain about something, especially about how good or true it is. There are no questions about the fact that as a culture, we are in a season of doubt. We are in a desert. In March, when the pandemic began, um, and the world began to suddenly shut down, there was a question often asked in my home. And the question was, how long is this whole thing going to last? And I would answer with certainty, I don't think it's going to last forever, period. And before we know it, we will be back to normal. Now, April 4th, our family gathered for a COVID-style birthday celebration. My mother celebrated her 70th birthday, and we gathered the family on the Zoom, and it was understandable so early on in the pandemic. The middle of April came, and we celebrated my wife's birthday. And then May arrived, and we celebrated my daughter's high school graduation. And my thought began to shift. It went from certainty of it not lasting forever to this can't last forever question mark. And I don't think we ever will be back to normal again. Well, June arrived and my father celebrated his 70th birthday and we did it in a COVID style. And then August where my parents celebrated 50th wedding anniversary. And we did what you can do uh, in a pandemic, celebrated it COVID style. We had my birthday, which was a COVID style birthday. We, we had our son who started 10th grade in a COVID style manner. And then we dropped off our middle daughter, Madeline, at college in Auburn, Alabama. Of course, we did that in a COVID style. And then September arrived. We picked up our daughter from Auburn with a 
confirmed positive COVID test. We celebrated our oldest daughter's 21st birthday in a COVID style. Our son started 10th grade in person in a COVID style. And this week, September 20th, Chapelwood will regather for in-person worship with an in-COVID style worship. The shift for me had gone with certainty of it's not going to last forever to, well, I'm not certain, to, to now there is, I'm not certain, but this may just last forever. And I went from certainty that we would return to normal to, I don't think normal will return the way we knew it to, Officially, COVID has killed normal. Doubt is the feeling of not being certain about something, especially about how good or true it is. Doubt has often received a bad rap in uh, the Christian culture. If you look at the Apostle Thomas and, and you think about, he, he simply asked for verification of the resurrected Lord when he was told of, of the sighting of Jesus and and when he encountered Jesus, Jesus said, feel the, the hole in my side, see the holes in my hands. You can believe. And forevermore, we have referred to Thomas as doubting Thomas, as if it's this blemish on his character. Doubt is often equated in Christian circles as the opposite of faith or the absence of faith. And to explore that, we have to ask the question, well, what is faith? Many Christians think faith is a certainty. It's, it's what I know to be true with every ounce of my being. But that's not the actual definition. In faith, there's always an element of, of, of not seeing there's always an element of trusting that which is still in the darkness. Hebrews 11 says that faith is confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. Faith at its very core is not certainty, but it is confidence. So if you are certain of something, you don't need to have faith. You don't need confidence. Because you already believe, you know that it's true. The desert of doubt is not a wasteland that most people think it is. Just as we have learned the last two weeks that in these deserts that there is life. The desert of doubt is no different. There are opportunities for spiritual growth in the desert of doubt. There is life in the desert. The story of John the Baptist in Matthew 11 that was read this morning provides a beautiful picture of how doubt can open the door to a deeper, more fully formed discipleship if we will accept the invitation. In our scripture this morning, John, we find, has been imprisoned. He was imprisoned by Herod because John dared to criticize Herod for marrying his brother's wife. And in his prophetic critique of the powerful ruler, Herod throws him in jail. Now, scholars suggest that John may have been in prison anywhere from six months to two years, but we don't really know the exact length of time. The prison was John's desert. It was his period of loneliness, his period of despair and doubt. And in this prison, John would eventually die at the hand of Herod. But while in this, in this prison, John did what many do when they have time on their hands. John did what many of us have done over these last six months with so much time on our hands. John reflected on his life and reflected on all that he holds deeply to be true and the beliefs that he has convictions on. He reflected on his ministry of fire and passion of repentance. He reflected on all these things in light of the fact that now Jesus had entered the scene and was, 
was in ministry. And so, on one particular occasion, John's followers met him at the prison and began to catch him up to date on all that Jesus had been doing in his ministry. And it was in this update where John sent his disciples with a question. John said, go to Jesus and ask him, are you the one who is to come or shall we wait for another? Now, John has his doubts about about Jesus. Uh, He begins to wonder if this person that he has put his belief in, that he has, has always believed in, is actually who he believed him to be. John is the one who Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew 11, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. And yet John questions and doubts. Now, if you are unaware of John's story, you may believe that this request or this question that John poses uh, may be a part of his character. He, is he an inquisitive individual that, that is always kind of open to searching for for something new and uh, things to be revealed. But when we reflect on his life, we see that John from the very beginning has been one with conviction of the identity of Jesus. You see, he was the son born of a miraculous circumstance. His parents were older. They didn't believe they were going to be able to have kids. And Zechariah and Elizabeth found themselves pregnant, and and Elizabeth went to go visit Mary, the mother of Jesus. And John, while in utero, the scripture tells us that John leapt for joy in Elizabeth's womb in the presence of the Messiah. John, before his birth, recognized that Jesus was the coming Messiah. And if that's not enough for you, we can think back about John's ministry. John's ministry was was about proclaiming and preaching repentance. Calling for people to lay down their wicked and evil ways and turn towards the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. To turn away from, from their old selves and turn to a new life. And John preached this message with passion. And John would, would pro- prophetically claim this truth to anyone who would listen. And he, he began to garner quite a following. And the scripture tells us that on one day, when John was in the Jordan River, preaching this message of repentance and baptizing individuals who came to, to turn their lives around, that Jesus approached and came to be baptized John, from the very beginning, said, no, I, I'm not the one who should be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. And Jesus put him at ease, saying, that time will come. This must occur. And the story of Jesus' baptism is this beautiful picture of, of the presence of God in the very midst of the people and All of creation pointing to the identity of Jesus. In in John chapter 1, it it says, and these are the words of John the Baptist, I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. So how can it be that John, who from birth recognized uh, Jesus as the Messiah, could now question his very identity? You see, the doubt is actually rooted in John having the opportunity to reflect and examine on his own beliefs. Not necessarily his beliefs in the identity of Christ, but the, his beliefs in what the ministry of the Messiah would actually look like. You see, as I mentioned, John's ministry was, was fiery. 
His approach was, was harsh and blunt, and it was, it was full of judgment and separation, and, and it was punctuated with this redemptive punishment. In Luke chapter 3, John is, is quoted saying to the people, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. You see, John's notion of the Messiah was consistent with his understanding of his own calling. You see, if all of humanity was sinful and, and, and needing judgment and, and repentance, then the Messiah would be the one to come out and dole out this judgment, and he would do it with the same fiery conviction as John did his own ministry. Continuing on in, in chapter 3 of Luke, uh, he says, He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Let me break this thing down for you. Okay, John believes that when the Messiah comes, he's going to become with fire and with this massive fork, and he's going to separate all the good from all the bad, and the bad are going to result, their, their, their end result will be the fire, the refining fire that will burn up all the sin and evil. You see, the doubt that creeps in for John occurs when he realizes that the ministry of Jesus does not match his understanding of the ministry of the Messiah. It wasn't rooted necessarily in all of the other uh, affirmations that he received from God. It was that he held this belief that had been formed through his life and that was, was portrayed out in his ministry. And his life was built on that understanding of the role of the Messiah. And to have that understanding and image challenge was actually shaking the very foundation of John's life. It was as if he was losing his faith and questioning everything he stood for. And so he asked the question, are you the one we've been waiting for, Jesus? Or is there still another to come? You see... John cannot imagine a Messiah who teaches in the synagogues and preaches good news of God's coming kingdom. John cannot imagine a Messiah who sits at the table with tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes. John cannot uh, imagine a Messiah whose ministry is engaged with those who have been marginalized and and pushed off to the side, those who were seen uh, and, and viewed as unworthy and unclean. When Jesus has his ministry described as one that is extending compassion to those who are the littlest, the least, the lost, it shakes John's very core. And causes doubt. And when Jesus receives this question, it would have been real easy for Jesus to say, go back and tell John that I am who he believes me to be. But he doesn't. He responds with this question uh, by giving the disciples an assignment. Go back and tell John what you have seen and what you've heard. You see, there is a lot of value in in testimony of that which can be seen. And Jesus knows this. And he also says, um, he describes his ministry using the language of two different texts out of the prophet 
of Isaiah's scrolls. He says, this is in chapter 35 of Isaiah and chapter 29, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. Tell them the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. You see, the blind, the lame, the lepers, the deaf, and the dead, and the poor, they all receive the mercy of Jesus. Jesus did not come in the way that John had imagined. He was not doling out judgment with a, with a winnowing fork and with fire. Jesus' primary activity throughout his ministry and to this day has been the restoration of those who have been broken and giving life to those who are lifeless. Jesus doesn't seek to convince John with his response. He simply invites John to receive the message of the witness of his disciples and then make his decision for himself. In effect, Jesus simply tells John the truth and then gives John the opportunity to either continue in his old ways of believing or to lay down that system and that theology and to pick up this growing understanding of who the Messiah actually is. Friends, make no mistake about it, walking in a desert of doubt can often feel as if we are losing our faith This probably explains why so many of us uh, shy away from wrestling with doubt. This probably explains why for many of us when we faced with doubt, we we push it off to the side and we we busy ourselves with our our work, with with our families, with our task. Even tasks that we may prioritize as as of the highest importance. But I tell you, the path to a deeper understanding of the good news of Jesus Christ must include time in the desert of doubt. You see, it is in the posture and manner in which we approach the desert that reveals the life that God wants to show for us there. We must, like John, be willing to lay down our deep-seated convictions about what we think we know to be true and open ourselves up for God to affirm those beliefs or reveal to us what is actually true. Honest doubt invites exploration. And friends, if I'm going to be honest with you, the last six months I have been wandering on some days aimlessly uh, in a desert of doubt. Things I had believed to be certain of in this world, in our, in our culture and in our society, beliefs I have held about humanity, beliefs I have held about God, beliefs in my understanding of, of what it means to be the church, and my own personal beliefs of what is meant to be called into ordained ministry in this church. Throughout this season, facing these hard questions that have challenged me and invited me to explore a deeper understanding of who this Messiah is. And on many days, I turned down that invitation. On many days, I would busy myself with the work of ministry or the, or the work with my family or, or doing something other than pausing and looking at what is before me exploring that which I have seen and that which I have heard. I tell you, when you turn down that invitation to explore, what I found was seasons where what life may have been in the desert seemed to have been all dried up and dead. A more calloused and and hardened heart experiencing days of bitterness and anger, thirsting for something more, longing for something different than what I was experiencing in that moment, and asking, are you the one 
we've been waiting for? Is this the church we've been building? Is this the culture and society that we've been shaping? I've got to tell you, when we explore without the invitation or with, with declining the invitation from Jesus uh, to be open to hear and see, that's, that path is dark. But in the midst of that, God had, did not abandon me. God has not abandoned us. God has been ever-present, ever-faithful, and consistently pointing to that which we have seen and heard. And so when I'm faced with questions like, seriously, this is the church? This is what we're called to be? We haven't gathered. It seems this is what I've always known the church to be. How can we be the church without gathering and worship and meeting for Sunday school? And then I hear of the ways that the body of Christ has come together to feed the hungry to help with housing for those who find themselves without a home. Meeting the very emotional, spiritual, psychological needs of those who find themselves wandering by stepping in and pointing folks and walking with folks through that desert. Friends, we simply get to open our eyes and see in a new way how God has been transforming us and pointing us towards life in this desert of doubt. Embrace the presence of God with you in the desert today. Explore with childlike faith the God who loves and the God who leads you to life in the desert. And with that, you can hold doubt not as uh, this negative aspect of your character or your, your spiritual maturity, but actually as a tool and a gift. Will you join me in prayer? God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather this day. We thank you for the story and the life of John the Baptist and the way that we can embrace his doubt and his questioning, and that we can find courage and strength in knowing that you, God, are always pointing to us to look and explore to that which we have seen and heard. So, Lord, we ask that you would raise up testimonies and witnesses around us so that we might find strength in what you are doing in this desert and through this desert. And we ask all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus, who conquered death once and for all. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as you go uh, your separate ways today, may you know that you are not alone in the desert. You are not alone in the desert of loneliness, the desert of boredom, or the desert of... Uh, of doubt that you have a God who loves you you have a God who we consider to be the truth and we hold on to that promise that the truth will set us free so go out knowing that you are loved Go out knowing that you are sustained. Go out knowing that God's kingdom is being revealed to you uh, every single day and when you see it, bear witness to that and share that so that others might find courage in it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.